Mr. Ramadurai. <clears throat> Authors, Mr. Vijay Kelka, Mr. Ajay Shah, Mr. Neil Kant Mishra, MD and India Strategist Credit Suisse, Sadit Chanoi, Chief India Economist J.P. Morgan, Ajit Ranade, President, Chief Economist, Aditya Birla Group. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. When Vijay Kelka called me and wanted me to launch the book, I knew I was no economist, but I couldn't say no to Vijay. And uh, Ajay also endorsed saying that both of us came with the same name. Thank you so much to the authors. It's a pleasure to be here for the launch of the book titled In Service of the Republic, The Art and Science of Economic Policy, authored by Mr. Kale Kerr and Mr. Shah, which I believe is a seminal piece of work. I've read the entire book, so what I'm saying is coming from the heart and not just for the function alone. As the authors themselves mention, in this book we have a toolkit for policymakers, the best toolkit if ever there was one. But for many others like me, this book provides a perception kit to understand why policymaking is such a challenging process. To all citizens at large, I recommend this as a must read, one which will make you empathetic to government failings and more admiration for their successes. The book has come at an opportune moment when India has emerged as one of the fastest growing markets in the world. India has the world's second largest startup ecosystem in the world, which is expected to witness year on year growth of about 10 to 12%. We have the second highest per capita consumption of online video in the world. India's stack is seeing success as seen from rapid adoption of digital payments and yes, 10% of Uber global rights happen here. So clearly, from these parameters, India is on the move. One must acknowledge that the improvement economic fundamentals has accelerated in the last few decades with the combined impact of strong government policy reforms, taxation reforms, RBI inflation focus, the stronger direct benefit programs, etc. I think the GOI, the Government of India, has taken significant initiatives to strengthen the economic credentials of the country, such as enhancing its global rank on the ease of doing business while maintaining the bold commitment on a sustainable model of development. The optimist that I am, I believe that the plethora of government missions and schemes on manufacturing, startup, digital will have a converging beneficial impact, which probably would be visible over the coming years. I think the stakes have been put on the ground to accelerate, whether it happens immediately or in the near future, towards a $5 trillion economy. But there are several issues that threaten this growth. As a $3 trillion economy, moving to a $5 trillion in real GDP terms, most economists believe that India will have to grow between 75 to 8% over the next five years to reach the desired mark by the end of 24-25. However, India is currently going through its own challenges, namely India's slowdown, including the lower industrial output, the banking crisis, the privatization of state entities, global trade wars, and domestic unemployment. Many economists are talking about both a structural as well as a cyclical slowdown. Recognition of these issues and their addressal through bold and significant remarks sooner rather than later is the need of the hour. A conducive economic policy is critical to achieving this goal. So I would say this to all the bureaucrats and the policy makers, if there is one book you need to pick, this has to be that one. The task ahead for the government of India is a challenging one, requiring absolutely fresh thinking, going back to the basics, and questioning outdated approaches. The timeline for our goal may look daunting, but is achievable if you have the clarity of vision, 
a sharp focus in effort and we stand united with the political will. In working towards this goal, we will be confronted with questions like, where do we need to build capacity? Which institutions need strengthening? Which market failures need to be addressed? And the authors, Mr. Kelker and Mr. Shah, provide the directional compass. For instance, one insight into fighting poverty the authors provide is through creation of a couple of anti-poverty programs as against tweaking every policy to make it anti-poverty. The authors point out that focusing on steady GDP growth will eventually reduce poverty. I do have a question for the authors, though, about their view on the per capita GDP, even if India achieves a 7% GDP growth in the future, but this is for later. Coming from the IT industry, I am an enthusiastic supporter of the Digital India-derived technology, and digitization is making us more uh, equitable society, and in doing so, we must keep a keen eye on access and affordability for the public at large. As the authors point, it's entirely true that a decision in intended to create impact X could play in unpredictable ways, and we felt across several aspects result in impact Y. Hence, understanding the cause and effect is important. Take, for instance, what is happening in the telecom sector, which has become an essential, like, say, the power sector. But if the market is becoming a monopoly, then something needs fixing. Taking a leaf from my own experience at TCS, we were one of the earliest organizations in the country to apply the system thinking approach to problem solving. We categorize problems as internal and external as an example, the problem of attrition was analyzed threadbare. If you had a bright but unhappy employee, you would address on priority. In other cases, we accepted some exits as bound to happen due to external forces beyond control. Knowing which problem to solve is important. We drew deeply from the work of Peter Senge, where TCS apply aspired to become a learning organization. Again, another MIT professor, Jay Forrester, gave us insights into simulating the interactions between objects in dynamic systems that created a system thinking DNA within the company, which remains as its core and is also one of the key reasons for, for its phenomenal success. These principles have stood the test of time for over 40 to 50 years. Another interesting principle we used was to track the say to do ratio, namely strategy to implementation and the intent was the gap must be nil. This characteristic was noticed when we were formulating our marketing position and led to the experience certainty tagline of TCS. Certainty, or out certainty of outcome is an important element in decision making. A key pointer in the book is often things may go wrong because of knowledge constraint. Any intervention needs a high level of knowledge about the problem and some predictions on how a proposed intervention may solve the problem. Lack of social science research reduces decision making to more like a shot in the dark, where chances of success is anyone's guess. I have seen this in my personal experience in the government as an advisor to the Prime Minister on skills development. All the data available put together provided only limited insights. Due to lack of data, we continue to debate on employment and jobs data we are still talking about labor management system, demand aggregation, and women disappearing from the workforce. Knowing where we are is important before we know where to go. One complexity in effective policy implementation is the federated structure we have. Policies in the center is one thing, implementation by the states is another. As conceded by the author, this uh, horribly complex issue, it's true that any government function is best performed at the lowest level, and we have a long, long way to go before our municipalities are reformed, capacities are built, and more importantly, mindsets are changed to shoulder the responsibility to design locally relevant schemes. Private enterprises have somewhat similar challenges, and they scale up very quickly like TCS did. Creating a uniformly understood vision, right down to the last person was a huge investment we made. As we asked employees through polls, through discussions, etc., on what top 10 by 2010 meant to each of them, and what did it inspire them to do, irrespective of the function, this gave us feedback loops 
we used to unify our efforts in a single direction. The result, as you know, is that we achieved the top 10 position a, a year ahead of schedule. In the process of doing so, we also created a distributed leadership model, empowering people so as to build 40 to 50 leaders who were ready to scale up their portfolios. The use of case studies such as these from private sector during the training of bureaucrats is one suggestion I'd like to offer to the government. Turning back to the book now, the authors remind us of another challenge. We need to get rich before we grow old. Again, drawing upon my own limited experience in the government, I can't help reflect upon the initial period of skill development in the country. Expectations were very high, and I was greatly charged with bringing about lasting change. But as I got deeper into the complex issue, I found that the interaction of past, inaction of past decades could not have been corrected in just a year or so. Merely launching one scheme after another would be nothing but an eye wash. I realized that there was a need to bring some fundamental changes and approaches. These included a mindset change, moving away from tracking input measures, such as training to measuring output measures, such as placements. It became apparent to me that it was critical to bring cohesiveness within the various ministry schemes on skill development through setting up common norms for the first time Nationwide schemes such as STAR, PMKVY were launched, which were subsequently improved upon, but it was a start. This was also the need to amend archaic policies, such as the Apprenticeship Act, and build an institutional structure at the national level. Those were the necessary foundational elements to develop a skill development ecosystem. In spite of this mammoth effort, some issues may not have got the focus they deserved, such as women in the workforce. The complexity, the interconnectedness of things, the unintended impact are all, all learnings. Since then, since then, much has happened, and all of this has helped us to reach a stage where we have a better understanding of the problem, so scaling up should be less problematic than before. In translating policy into action, what role the government must play is an important question raised in the book. In my view, an enabling role of the government is critical, while the market can be left to devise efficient and effective ways to chart the course. In spite of the complexities of policy making, our development path for the future must be a sustainable one. India has been identified as a nation at most risk due to climate change. We are already witnessing devastating natural disaster at a high frequency, fatal heat waves, worst water crisis, and what a stress, not to mention the health hazards posed by polluted cities, which are making headline news every day. The country's aspirations are higher than they have ever been. We see it in consumers, our youth, our job seekers. Our government is trying to lead this effort as we aim to become a $5 trillion economy. What better time to dip into the wisdom offered by the authors, Mr. Ajay Shah and Mr. Vijay Kelkar, to recalibrate our thinking to strengthen the impact we wish to create for this promising land of ours. Once again, I would like to thank Ajay and Vijay for packaging so well their vast experience as economists and government servants and putting together in a succinct, simple, and immensely readable book. Every Indian who is interested in the development of India should be reading this book and reflecting upon all its wisdom. The book is already a bestseller. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you, Mr. Ramadurai, uh, for, for your opening remarks. And indeed, uh, when you say it's a must-read book, I, I strongly endorse that. My name is Ajit Ranade, and I am your train conductor for the evening. My pleasant job is to make sure we don't have too many fist fights here. But first of all, I have a pleasant duty to introduce the people on the panel. So in the center of the panel is Dr. Vijay Kelkar, who was chairman of the 13th Finance Commission and served as secretary to Government of India and in various capacities and director of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and director of the IMF. In 2011, the president of India conferred the Padma Vibhushan, Dr. Vijay Kelkar. <laughs> He's also one of the two authors of the book. On his left is uh, Dr. Ajay Shah, who has worked at the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy and the Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research. 
and at the Ministry of Finance. He's currently a professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in Delhi. Dr. Ajay Shah. <laughs> And uh, to the right of Dr. Kelkar, we have uh, Dr. Sarjit Chenoy, who is the J.P. Morgan's uh, chief economist and was recently appointed as a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He has worked previously with the IMF, McKinsey, and is a member of the Advisory Council to the 15th Finance Commission. Dr. Sarjit. <laughs> and on the extreme right, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Nilkandrishan. Mr. Nilkan Mishra is uh, managing director and India strategist and co-head of the Asia Pacific study, co-head Asia Pacific strategy uh, for Credit Suisse. He also is a member of the advisory council to the 15th Finance Commission and a member of the Prime Minister Economic Advisory Council and also an advisor to the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget, Budget Management Committee appointed by the Indian government. Mr. <laughs> so. Uh, a very powerful, distinguished panel. And uh, the task here today is to discuss, well, actually not discuss. This is the reason we are all here. The name of the book, In Service of the Republic. Notice that the word republic is in large font, but there's no connection to a television channel by the same name. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I'm, I was trying to, uh, I was trying to think about how best to describe, uh, it's not possible this book, uh, but uh, to be somewhat unfair to you, but I thought this is like Freakonomics uh, in, of public policy. Because it's, I'm using Freakonomics because it's very well known. So, you know, Dr. Kilker and Dr. Shah, this is Mumbai, that this is a book on economic policy, actually. There are no pictures in this book. There is There are no graphs, and there's a sellout crowd with people standing in the aisles. So this is a great applause for you people. <laughs> We are going to begin. The, the format for the evening is that uh, I'd ask the authors to sp say very, very briefly about uh, the book or about any opening remarks. So I'll, I'll request Dr. Kilkar and then followed by Dr. Shah, and then we will have the sort of discussion and avoid fist fights. Sure, yeah, I think this, whichever. Dr. Danade, Dr. Chaha, Dr. Chinoy, Dr. Mishra, and distinguished guests. Let me first thank uh, each one of you for coming here. Uh, many of old friends are here, but uh, one of my classmates made a, didn't, couldn't resist to make a remark. Vijay, we are here because out of affection for you and respect for Dr. Chaha. <laughs> <laughs> So that's roughly also tells about the division of labor we had in writing this book. Uh, I thought I'd just briefly talk about uh, the sort of how this book began. I mean, I'm, book content I'm going to speak about because we have really far more knowledgeable people to look at the book critically. Uh, I came back from my uh, uh, assignment in the IMF in 2002, and immediately I had the great privilege to work with Jasun Singh Ji. And I think in my way that was a golden age of policy making, as I look back. You had the Prime Minister and you had the Finance Minister were both by instinct and by value of the truly liberal political leaders. And I, the, that time, First time I met Ajit, Ajit also, uh, Ajay was also in uh, finance ministry. And we started working together on a number of issues uh, which both either prime minister or finance minister want to work on, on policy issues. And uh, it was a great collaboration. I learned a lot. And I think uh, that's where my interest started in really thinking more sort of analytically on policy making and both policy making and policy implementation. And that was truly very creative uh, era. In Atlas, for technocrats like me and Ajay, it was very creative uh, work. And uh, you know, I just want to make a one remark. Uh, Ajay, the, the crisis, the, the, Ajay, uh, the, the Bajpayee's reform program was very different in 1991. 1991 was crisis driven while Bajpayee was trying to launch it through consensus based, the consensus led. 
it was really done with a great deal of uh, building of consensus about ideas, about analysis. So very different approach we had taken, we had talked about it. And then the India was growing very rapidly, and I was uh, uh, totally enamored by our growth process, but I uh, described it as a growth Indian growth turnpike, in fact, that's how I described India. And I was convinced that we are going to become fastest growing economy in the world within one decade and beat uh, everybody. But somehow things didn't work out that way. After, and, and we both uh, were watching what was happening. I had also, unfortunately, the occasion then to go more into the uh, uh, width and depth of India, because then I was working with Finance Commission. Finance Commission, as you know, is obliged to visit every state. And then one looked at really the issue of state capacity, state administration, what the problems are of converting policies into outcomes. And then after that, I also worked on the problems of the local government. So that gives much sort of a different perspective to me about India's economic challenges. Or making, so far, I would, that is my discipline, talked about, you make policies to overcome market failures. But increasing my experience with state, center, and local level realize that probably government failures or public system failure are far more important constraints on India than the market failures. And if you're thinking of a meta strategy for a country, a great grand strategy, I think it's important to recognize what is the dominant constraints on your system. And if you remember our sort of Panditji, when he became prime minister, he identified dominant constraint was essentially lack of capital markets, lack of uh, infrastructure, and lack of institutions. That took us to second wave of reform where uh, Manmohan Singh and his colleagues saw a different constraints. Constraints were essentially we are not using markets, we're delinking business rivers. But I do believe that now we have to reach that, again, crossroad, when we have to launch a next wave of new sort of understanding of India's problems. And mind you, both these people, Nehru, his time, and Manmohan and Narasimha, was based on detailed analysis and debate in, 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 the, in the Indian uh, uh, intellectuals and uh, even the political level. So, we require similar kind of discussion and debate. And this book is really our attempt to contribute to this third wave or third, what we call the third track for India's uh, new agenda for uh, what's task ahead. And, uh, and we have identified essentially the, what our constraints are and how to sort of overcome them. So I'll stop at that. And Just I'll... before we give it to Ajay, Mark 3, where is Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3? Mark 1 was Nehru. Just be, uh, uh, in fact, if you remember, uh, Nehru, Pitambar Pan, Manmohan Singh, Shukumar Chakravarti, the others created a Mark One, which gives a breaking India's backwardness, colonial. No, uh, Dr. Kelkar, I, sorry, you need to tell the audience. So he, they, the book says that we had Mark One, Nehru's time, and we have Mark Two, I think, Manmohan Singh's time, yeah, Manmohan and Singh. we now need Mark Three. How many of you know what is Mark One, Mark Two, Mark Three? Only one person. So you need to tell them why Mark 1 and Mark 2 and Mark 3. Well, okay, let me like, tell you a secret. This is, this is really, I'm going to rub it in. I'm sorry. Four out of five people here are engineers. <laughs> That's why this Mark 1. So please tell them what. <laughs> no, but I use other words also, I'm sure. But, but, uh, but you are somebody up. And, this is just the beginning. This is the first Google. Anyway, please, Dr. Ajay. I agree with Ajay. So you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, Vijay Kelkar and I have the feature that we are completely undisciplined and we take interest in many, many fields. Okay, so what you're supposed to do in life is to specialize and then reach the pinnacle of knowing everything about nothing. But we've been very undisciplined and we've done many, many fields. We're, experienced in working in numerous fields. Uh, this book was an attempt at writing about principles of public policy in a way that's not narrowly connected to any one field. So it's an attempt at looking for something deeper. And it's also highly interdisciplinary because 
to do public policy, you need to pull together public economics, law, public administration, political economy, political science. So it's our attempt at uh, pulling together what we have learned uh, between us in many, many years across many fields and turning it into some bite-sized chapters. So our publishers told us that the recipe to make a book work is no tables, no graphs, no equations, no pictures. short bite-sized chapters, and end each chapter with a summing up. <laughs> so this is the recipe of how to write a book like this. And so we've tried to make it more readable and accessible. And our hope is that people working in an unrelated domain, that one that we may have never seen, would find these kinds of principles useful. So to resort to an engineering analogy, uh, there's this famous line that a truly successful software tool is one that is used in ways that were unanticipated by its author. So what we would like most is for this book to be used in domains that we don't know anything about, and somebody should find it useful. Like who would have imagined a cell phone would be used for, for missed call? <laughs> That's th thanks, Ajay. Uh, so indeed, I, I would like to strongly, in fact, uh, reiterate how these people, both of them are what I call intellectually restless animals, extremely, you know, extremely interested in everything. And as I said, my, uh, sorry, Dr. Kilgar, this is our evening to pull your leg. But when he was uh, chairman of the Finance Commission, so I had occasion to visit him a few times. And you go on a late afternoon in, in, in Delhi in this, in this grand office, bureaucratic offices, but what do you find? First of all, he's all by himself. The secretaries have been shunted out. And there's Tchaikovsky playing, or maybe Schubert, I don't know. So, so there's a very, very calming and pleasant experience for a chairman of the Finance Commission. So indeed, this book, as Ajay said, actually, that's a good way of summing it. It's actually principles of public policy. Therefore, it's not necessarily about what's going on in the economy right now. And I know we have to talk about it. This is not really about a book evening. We have to talk about what's happening in the economy. But it's, it's uh, as Ajay said, there are 40 chapters. Uh, and each chapter is not more than a few pages uh, long. And it's got all these uh, almost uh, you know, aphorisms or like Aesop's fables kind of language. Sometimes they are like homilies. But I think they are, as Ajay said to me, that this is not a book to be uh, just thought about. It's the current economic scenario. It's actually something which is hopefully a little more uh, timeless than that. So uh, we will jump right into the discussion. I was thinking maybe uh, uh, I'll ask Sajid to jump in with his first impressions or um, what what were let's say let's say what were your two key points that you got from the book. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ajay. It's delighted to be here. Um, I'm just stating the obvious when I say this is one of the most readable books I've ever read. Uh, I have yet to see a book which is so clear-headed in its analytical framework rooted in first principles. And that is not a surprise at all coming from Dr. Kelkar and Ajay. I remember meeting Ajay the first time when I was a graduate student in Stanford in 1999, exactly 20 years ago. And that was the time where the golden era that Dr. Kelkar spoke about where policy interventions were being bandied by everybody. And Ajay's, the line I most identify Ajay Shah with is, but what is the market failure? So when I opened the book, I said, how many pages do I need to turn to find the phrase, what is the market failure? And I think it was page seven, right? <laughs> Six pages longer than I thought. But uh, to, 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 to come to your point, Ajit, on what I take away is literally that. that you, know, you put on CNBC or some other news channel today, and there are a 1,000 talking heads with 1,200 policy prescriptions every hour. And I think we have to go back to first principles as the book uh, delineates so well. Before we think of any policy, what is the market failure that we're trying to address? What is the intervention? And is the intervention going to address that market failure, number two? And number three, do we have the capacity to execute that intervention? And these may sound like three very simple questions, but when you think about them, they, I think they create the, the, uh, the analytical framework behind everything else. The other part that I absolutely loved, because we, we haven't heard this term in India a lot, we love to use fiscal deficit and borrowing, the marginal cost of public funds, right? The marginal cost of public funds at a time where everybody's advocating more spending and more deficits. Uh, it, you, I, I'd urge everyone to go back and understand, because I think one of the most enjoyable chapters for me in the book was, and I'm, I don't want to use any economics jargon here, but tracing out the gender equilibrium impact of any policy intervention. It's easy to say what the first on impact is, but what are the ripple effects throughout the economy? And when we add them all up, 
what is the net cost and net benefit of the intervention. I think on the fiscal front, computing what the marginal cost of public funds, I think, in India is more important than ever. I'll end, Ajit, by just saying, I, I, as a transition to the contemporary, this is such a timely book, because think of where we are right now. There's a raging debate going on on the basics in India. We're in the midst of a six-quarter slowdown, but we're arguing, arguing on the fundamentals. Is this demand or is it supply-driven? Is it cyclical or is it structural? Is it globally driven or is it domestically induced? And I think when you have to address these questions, these weighty questions, you really need to have strong analytical frameworks behind you of the kind that the book uh, provides. I'll use one last example because we're sitting in the midst of a, a GST council meeting. Uh, Dr. Kelkar, of course, is the, the, the grand author of uh, this idea uh, two finance commissions ago. And again, there's a debate on, you know, should we be raising GST rates now? And this is not an easy question to answer. Consumption is slowing sharply. GST is a consumption tax. Do we really want to raise GST rates now? And the obvious answer may be no, but then think about the general liberal impact, right? If you don't raise GST rates now, there's a fiscal implication. You have to cut some spending. Is the fiscal multiplier of that going to be greater than uh, uh, your GST rate hike? Uh, if you announce a deferred increase, will you uh, front load consumption? Will households spend more today if they know GST rates are going up in six months? So you don't cut rates now, but you announce a deferred increase. There are any number of interesting analytical questions, all of which I think can be grounded and answered in the kind of framework that I that they out in the book. So it was a true delight to read a Bible for policy making, I would argue. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Sajid. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, the, as Sajid said, it, the book begins very quickly with this uh, uh, framework of market failure. First, identify the market failure. But he, it also talks about the importance of incentives. And uh, it also talks about many other principles. For example, if you're trying to pursue multiple objectives, you need multiple instruments. You can't pursue multiple objectives with just one instrument. And you give the example of the Rural Employment Guarantee Program and so on. And then somewhere later, they also, there is a, some, what I got is the abiding distrust of uh, state and state intervention. So I'm going to read this paragraph before I come to Nilkan. So the policy landscape in India, I'm just reading from the book, the policy landscape in India today is a sprawling scene where a large number of state interventions are in place and most of them work poorly. The path to progress lies in narrowing the scope of the state, picking fewer battles, and first learning how to run the government at high levels of state capacity. The four primal requirements of a state are the criminal justice system, the judiciary, the tax system, and financial regulation. Our prime, our prime objective should be to learn how to be capable state in these four areas. So, uh, Dilkan, what, uh, what would you, I, would, I want to get your first in, initial reaction before we start asking questions about the current economy. Yeah, so my first impression was exactly as, as, as Sajid said. No, I mean, no, you can't repeat what he said. We no, 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 but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it, is, it is so obvious that, you know, it is... It is That's taken as a theorem now. It's a given. You can't... The theorem is proved. Okay. It is a wonderful book. It's a must-read for everybody. Uh, Next. Uh, but more than that, it's, it's, uh, it is something that makes you think that what's happening in India right now is not something which is unique. In many ways, when you, when you get frustrated with the fact that the government has, say, intentions to disinvest, right? So the, the BPCL, uh, the repeal of the BPCL Nationalization Act happened in 2016, and there is still uh, a lack of trust in the markets that it will even happen this year, right? So it's been it will be three and a half years, and the sale has not yet happened. Uh, when you see this from close quarters, it can become very frustrating. It can be very depressing. Uh, but when you, um, and, and then you see the vested interests in, in West, uh, parts of the government, and you start getting frustrated, will this ever change? When you read the book, because you're starting from first principles uh, as to uh, why should we, or if at all, should we hand over some control to the bureaucrats, what are they incentivized by? And you realize that these are basic systemic challenges. And it somehow gives you a sense of comfort that, uh, that look, we are not unique. It puts into context I mean, some of the stuff that I'm reading even about China as to how 
when Deng Xiaoping started to open up, I mean, the kind of things that it did. Um, and, um, and, and, and th that, that for me so far, and I, I think the marginal cost of public funds is something right. that I had never thought of. I mean, yeah. I must confess that, uh, 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 and I must give away something in the book, I think, uh, as a teaser. So every rupee that the government spends, uh, according to uh, the authors, actually costs two and a half to three and a half rupees, right? So, so the fact that you take the money from a corporate, you are taxing something at, say, 28% GST, you are actually disincentivizing some activity. And that is an economic cost and which you need to bear. So when the government spends one rupee, especially given that their efficiency is a lot lower than that of the private sector, uh, you are actually dealing with an inefficiency of six times, which I think is, is astounding. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, and, and I think they mention it. I'm also surprised there's not more work being done on this. That's right. So there, in fact, that's another conceptual uh, sort of a, a gem in the book, which is about the cost of marginal cost of funds. If you want to uh, do one dollar, one rupee of spending on the poor, the state, that is the government, ends up spending a minimum of three rupees to get the cost of cost to society. But since you mentioned privatization, and let's jump in right away to the current scene. So, Dr. Kilkar, you mentioned the Vajpayee regime uh, indeed was, you know, very um, extraordinary in many ways. Actually, they came at it they, during their government. First of all, I think they had some 23 coalition partners, and they had they suffered because of sanctions due to the nuclear test. There was a drought. Then there was a huge recession. Then there was the dot-com bust. Everything that could go wrong actually went wrong. And yet we had this huge, uh, almost a glorious period, uh, which took off. And one of the things, the distinctive things about uh, that government was the dis what we call disinvestment. But you know, this was kind of a Indian euphemism, privatization. And uh, Mr. Shauri was uh, the minister. And one of the first uh, disinvestment program was the Maruti. And all you bankers, I mean, I don't mean you, but Basically, they tried to say that it will not happen, they tried to beat out, there's something called the IPO, I hope everybody knows what an IPO is. And you have to kind of, uh, that's a very, that's, there's an art and science in deciding the price, and they really beat it down, beat it down, uh, and then finally the shares were offered to the public. And lo and behold, it was, you know, it was a spectacular success. Many people believe, actually, that is what set the ball rolling for several years for India's uh, uh, disinvestment or privatization. So, Dr. Kelkar, the government has been trying, I mean, after that, we've never really had any successful uh, regime like that. Neither the UPA1 nor UPA2, even NDA2, I call it NDA1 was Vajpayee, NDA2, and now NDA3. They do have these ambitious targets, but inevitably you end up uh, asking LIC to buy whatever, you know, ONGC to buy something. So it's like left pocket to the right pocket. It's not really net private money or foreign money coming into this. So uh, in that context, if this is BPCL or Shipping Corporation of India you're talking about or Container Corporation, how would you, I mean, what lessons to draw from policy if, which were successful 20 years ago for the current government? I think in that regime, uh, who was it? Minister was very decisive. Mr. Arush Shori was a and if you remember I mean, uh, what Ajay said, the debate about our second track was one of the major contributor was uh, Arun Shori. His, his beautiful piece he wrote as in 1969 in uh, EPW. And Arun Shori did it from conviction, and uh, Prime Minister gave complete freedom. I mean, it's a you know, you had a prime minister who was uh, uh, genuinely believed in uh, consulting everybody and uh, uh, share sort of responsibility and, and power to do that. So you think the current government doesn't have conviction about this investment? No, I'm just mentioning about Mr. Bajpai. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ajay. Uh, you re remember that uh, you had written some time ago that maybe what you should do, because what happens, by the way, in these uh, IPOs or strategic sales is that there's always somebody who's going to accuse the government of selling the family jewel cheaply. So I think, remember, you had said that you should just have a trickle flow. So you want to say something about how to disinvest? So this is a, this is, we have written about policy, okay? We now want concrete advice. 
Well, I, how would you sell BPCL? I would rather tell you a funny story. Um, <laughs> at that time, Kelkar and I wrote a policy note uh, preaching the merits of the approach taken with HDFC and ICICI for a gradual expansion of the non-government shareholding so that over time it quietly became a dispersed shareholding corporation without a promoter. Okay, and I think these are remarkable, important achievements in Indian history where we've created a whole new framework for how to go from a government-owned company to a publicly listed limited liability corporation. And uh, 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 Kelkar was very careful and astute. So he said, we're not going to get into a big fight. We're going to send this in sealed cover only to Arun Shuri. So we did not give it to anybody else. We did not release this to anybody. So a lot of the stuff that has come out later started there. And Arun Shuri called Kelkar and said, who is this third-rate economist called Ajay Shah that you're writing stuff with? <laughs> But, you know, one example which is in the book, uh, which must be read, is the whole ex whole episode of UTI. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see that portion, uh, Nilkant. Uh, the UT you know, UTI, uh, would you call it a market failure? What happened, by the way, in UTI is that there was this uh, guaranteed return scheme called US-64 from the 1960s, I think, and which was getting into an impossible balloon. And the government was just completely sort of broke trying to service that. So they devised a very clever way, and eventually the government made a handsome profit on it. So is that, what's the policy lesson there? Maybe Sajid, you want to come on that? If you, did you read about the Suti, right? Yeah, I, I, and, and Suti today, it's called, what is the state undertaking for UTI, a specific, special undertaking. So it's become, a, it's become, so the government of India actually rescued this thing by putting public money but eventually it made a profit, so no public money was involved. So yeah. what's the policy lesson? No, I, Ajit, there are many lessons one can draw. The, 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 I think the reason why privatization and disinvestment is particularly important today is because we're in this um, kind of uh, vicious cycle, right, where how do you use, so, so let me step back. I would argue that the, the constraint today is monetary policy is running its course. We've had a lot of rate cuts that are not transmitting for a variety of different reasons, which we could discuss in the financial sector. Uh, it's a heightened risk aversion in the financial system. And world over, you will see, this is a debate that uh, you know, Stiglitz has spawned for the last five years, that monetary policy is losing efficacy. You need fiscal policy to kick in. And that should be the normal prescription in times like this. Now, the problem with India is our starting points, as the book alludes to in some places, are already quite unfavorable. I mean, you know, if you add up all the there's deficit, no fiscal space left. Right? There's no fiscal space left. Uh, you know, if you add up center, state, public sector, this is not a normative assessment. I'm just making a positive uh, combine that if you add up center, state, PSU, you're looking at eight to nine percent of GDP. Uh, we've written about this for the last year, saying India's net financial savings are seven to eight percent of GDP. So, if the public sector is already using up all financial savings, there are limits to how much fiscal policy can be countercyclical. And so, the challenge right now is, on the one hand, Growth is weak, tax collections are weak, you want automatic stabilizers to kick in, you want the deficit to widen to play a counter-cyclical role, but given such unfavorable starting points, you essentially could be counterproductive because at these levels when deficits rise, it pushes up market interest rates and that undermines its own efficacy. The reason I'm going into this big digression is disinvestment and privatization play How? dual purposes, right? right? One purpose is you get more efficiency because you get better governance, better management. But think of the fiscal impulse. When you're actually uh, consolidating your fiscal deficit by selling assets, right? you can get a headline reduction in the deficit and reduce borrowing. But because we counted above the line, and it should be below the line really, the fiscal impulse is actually positive. So the one thing you want to do exactly in this environment to in a way to have your cake and eat it too is sell assets on the variety of ways that the authors find out, you can still bring the deficit down. And while the headline deficit is coming down, fiscal policy is actually counter-cyclical because the underlying fiscal impulse here is positive. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you should be selling assets to pay your credit card bill. When you sell assets, you should have capital assets that you create from it on the expenditure side. But I think that's why privatization... Is, are there any assets that governments should own? Are you saying everything the government should just get out of all the assets that it owns? You know, I, I don't want to take corner solutions. I think there are legitimate constraints uh, okay. that uh, that uh, that the government faces. But I would say, but I think certainly these three which have been identified. I think there were hundred identified with India. Yes, yes. But let me ask Neelkant. 
he, you know, the, uh, since you also advised the government, both of you, uh, basically monetary policy is not working and fiscal policy, there's not much space, you know, there's, uh, there's only so much you can spend. You're already busting the targets. So what else can the government do? I mean, we are in a very low growth. The, this year looks like we'll be lucky to get to 5%. So what, what can be done? So uh, to put the, the, the disinvestment issue from a, uh, a, a give, uh, viewing through it, it, it through a, a different prism. See, India, given its per capita GDP, lacks risk capital. So if you need to have, uh, uh, say, 50 million tons of steel capacity, you need to invest $50 billion. Uh, even if it is one is to one debt to equity, you need $25 billion of equity in steel companies who want to invest. Now you may start to have that. But when India was starting off, very few people had that kind of capacity. So the state perhaps needed to get in and build those assets. So build the power plants, build the steel plants, and so on and so forth. But once they are built, then the state needs to exit. And I think that is a process that needs to uh, really start. There are uh, non-core sectors where the government, and actually the government has been very clear. I mean, politically, I think there is a clarity. I think where- What needs to be sold? Sorry? On what needs to be sold? Yes. Right? I think there is clarity. I think uh, Niti Aayog had given a long list in 2016. I think there's been political clearance. I, I think the, the executive is, is what needs to speed it up. So the, coming to the signal, so Dr. Kirill, you the, wanted to add something, yeah, right? I just want to make two points. Two yeah, sure. Two issues. One uh, relates to UTI, and I thought being in Mumbai and some other dramatist person is sitting here, I should mention that in this book, we are not mentioning UTI first crisis because we used to talk about UTI two. <laughs> UTI one happened when I was finance secretary, and Himan Bhai would remember Himendra, myself. We were strolling in Washington, D.C., uh, and we first got a uh, message from Delhi about the crisis in UTI. And uh, so him and I and myself, we had a meeting with the minister. Uh, and that's a sort of your chapter on crisis, how to manage crisis. So when you manage a crisis, you may have to sometimes suspend some of the things which you do in normal circumstances. And it just happens, I mean, maybe Himan Bhai was not there. We, government could have taken a very different view and we would have probably made the crisis worse. But his first advice wasn't exactly be followed about first calming the market and then give a structural solution. And for structural solution, uh, we requested Deepak Bhai to chair a committee how to. And then uh, we gave more solution. I thought it was an engineering solution. And um, creating, a, he is here and he can explain it better. But I think it was skillfully solved the problem. Unfortunately, uh, it was not followed through later on. That's why you, they reappeared, the crisis, UTI crisis two came. So, uh, so crisis one was really handled by, uh, with Himan by his help and uh, Deepak by his help. And I think we did a remarkable, not different than what was done, if Deepak correct me if I'm wrong, also later done by Paulson in terms of this uh, tarp. tarp, yeah, exactly the same, but the uh, Deepak pre-data and he sort of pre-envisioned the same strategy more than uh, 15, 15 years ago. So, Maybe tarp was copied by the from the from the Indians. And but on that point, and, on that, yeah. And other point was about uh, 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 the disinvestment. Uh, there again, uh, when our petroleum secretary was working on disinvestment, I think. I don't want to embarrass, but Nimesh Bhai was at that time helping Ministry of Petroleum. And some of the concerns the government always have in this environment is that this point which was made, that you should not be accused that you are selling your publicity too cheaply. And I must confess, uh, uh, Nimesh Bhai has most creative uh, proposals. Unfortunately, the government completely dropped uh, going ahead with the program. Otherwise, we again would have been the first one in the country to start very imaginative of uh, using sort of mimicking options. Uh, so the government was still kept an option. So in case, uh, you know, it's a bit sophisticated what I'm explaining, probably Nimesh can explain it better. But it was very creative, uh, so exactly solved that problem. But, uh, but that was, those were days of, 
you could do. No, so, so I, I so want to just actually, ten yeah. seconds, Ajit. I think for we we we're not doing. We should do justice to the book, which is full of analytical frameworks. But this and is the people are going to read the book. We no, want no, to but, use but, this but, evening also to talk about the economy. But to one thing about your your issue, right? All state interventions in the book. Correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm paraphrasing correctly, whether it's ownership of assets, whether it's taxation, regulation, expenditure, are guided by these four principles. That what is the market failure? Is there asymmetric information? Is there market power? Are there public goods? Are there externalities? Right. And so the the book lays out a very clear framework to say only if you fulfill one of these criteria should the state be involved in one But of these know, different uh, forms. But you know, there is market failure and there is state failure also. So if just because the market is failing, the government may not be able to succeed. In fact, I should say there's a quote in the book which says, they, they basically it's an advocate, advocate for a government which is dull and boring. <laughs> Dullness in matters of government is a good sign and not a bad one. In particular, dullness in parliamentary government is a test of its excellence, <laughs> an indication of success. We need a dull and boring parliament. Belgium, think of Belgium. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but I want to take back this TARP, since you mentioned TARP. See, we have a crisis. Last year we had several crises, and ILFS is one of the best known. And is ILFS a recipe for TARP like uh, rescue? I know you are saying, you know, we are, we are, we are reading a book on principles. Go, for God's sake, don't ask a specific question, but you can't be on this panel and not answer questions like that. Anybody want to take this question? Yeah. yeah. So I want to make an analogy with UTI. Okay. So, so are you going to answer the ILFS question? Yeah, I will. But okay. I first want to make an analogy with UTI. Uh, in the textbook world, the resolution of UTI should have been the work of a financial resolution corporation. Not the government. Yeah. So we'll come to exactly who. But what we need in the institutional infrastructure of India, what is missing, is some kind of financial resolution capability. What the FSLRC calls the resolution corporation. They don't know what is FSLRC. Is. FSLRC is the financial sector legislative, legislative reforms, reforms commission. committee what has later been encoded into what is called the FRDI bill, the Financial Resolution. Which was tabled in Parliament but withdrawn. But withdrawn. Okay. Now that institution is a missing piece of our landscape. So with the benefit of hindsight, I want to say that when faced with UTI, basically Fox and DEA created a hacked up custom resolution strategy. But that was, that's what the US did in TARP. Yeah. Let me come to that. Okay. So uh, in the absence of a resolution capability, when faced with UTI, there was a tiny team at DEA which basically thought about it. Bimal Jalan had the basic idea of we're going to do it like a good bank, bad bank. And the entire execution was done of choosing how much bad news to impose on households, how much public money goes in, cut it into SUTI and UTI AMC, sell the shares of UTI AMC, repeal the UTI Act, and leave SUTI as a legacy for the future. And as we all know, very things worked out well. Okay. ILFS. Yeah. So now let's turn to ILFS. The first best answer for ILFS was IBC. Okay. ILFS has professional lenders. There are no household lenders really for all practical purposes. So what you need is for those guys to get into the room and make a deal about what we're going to do. Are we going to liquidate it? Are we going to do uh, debt restructuring? Are some parts rescuable in a more rational, commercially motivated way? Are some parts not rescuable? What you really needed was the metaphors of IBC. But for some historical reasons, the way the IBC was structured, it was uh, the financial firms were fully kept out and the FRDI was not in place. And so there was this peace, peace in the landscape that was But this gap. is one of the landmark and is fantastic reforms, uh, achievements of, of the current government. And in fact, it happened in the previous government, 2016. Yeah. In fact, it's the first time that we actually have a proper bankruptcy code in the country. Yeah, No, I, I agree with that. But I'm just saying on ILFS, the right path for ILFS will, will was TARP the committee of creditors. Yeah, but will TARP rescue work for ILFS? The TARP rescue is extremely difficult, particularly under Indian conditions of state capacity. You will remember the criticisms of the TARP implementation in the United States where many lawmakers legitimately criticized the working of TARP, that there is some Neil Kashkari who plays God who gets to choose which company lives and yes, which company yes. so, dies. And how do you envelope this in a rule of law system? So that's that's the question I want to ask. That the, Actually, what happened in TARP is on one weekend, some Saturday, the Treasury Secretary comes and gathers all the congressmen, the elected people, and spooks them. This is doomsday. Unless you sanction $700 billion of taxpayer money, we are all doomed. They, they don't know what's going on. This is a sign up. And then this legislation comes and TARP is a fantastic success. Post facto. So question. Are, you know, only when you are successful post facto is policy success. So, I mean, 
would you have supported TARP, uh, maybe, you know, Sajid? Uh, I think, Ajit, there are, there are important differences here. And I, I think know, they were, they were, they were we should gloss over them. So TARP happened in an environment of um, you're in the midst of a crisis. Liquidity had completely frozen. And valuations were much below fundamental values. Right. And Same. that was the market failure Prior there. is similar. No, no, I'll come to that in a second. Well, that was the market failure there, right? And so there was so much asymmetric information that you required some public intervention. Right? And that was the motivation for TARP. We can talk about ILFS, but today the situation in my reading in the NBFC sector is actually a market failure of a different kind. 16, 17 months later, we can't argue that this is a liquidity issue. We really don't know because there are enough examples. There are actual solvency problems out there. And I think that's a very important distinction to draw. TARP happened because existing values were much below fundamental values, and they were proved to be so. Because when the market normalized, the US government actually made a heck load of money. Here, it's actually a solvency issue. But I would argue, again, the market failure is asymmetric information. So fa uh, fair enough. So you're saying it's not exactly no. similar. But let me get, to, sorry, let me get Neil Kant in. So we, we didn't, you didn't quite come to that question. I said fiscal policy is not working. So ILFS is just one reason. You know, we are in a situation where GDP is going barely at 5% or less. Uh, credit growth, you know, on one hand, you have the stock markets are at all time high, the foreign exchange reserves are at all time high, the inflation rate is fairly moderate, uh, the, you know, uh, the exchange rate is fairly stable. So all this macro, what wonderful news. And then you see GDP growth low, unemployment high, uh, private investment stagnant for several years and years. How do we get out of this? By the way, uh, everything that you say about Indian economy, the opposite also is true. So the, you... <laughs> How do we get out of this? Very strong macro, apparently, and yet the economy is not in a good shape. No, I think there are, there are many things that can be done. Uh, I think the first and most important is to get interest rates lower. So what we have managed to solve for is bring down our inflation. So the 60-year average is 7.5, four-year average is 3.7. Right now, because the one year answer is... Inflation up. is under control. I mean, it's fairly Inflation okay. is under control. But nothing else has changed in the sense that the cost of borrowing for most most companies has not changed so the even the government has not really adjusted to it in the sense that how do you unleash the animal spirits because the main driver of growth is people investing people consumer confidence business confidence see, that is that is an additional requirement but i think the first thing is to get interest rates down effective interest rates not just the repo rate right uh, even the cost of borrowing for the government has not come down. See, if the, if the debt to GDP of the government is 45% and the cost of borrowing is 7%, your interest cost as a percentage of GDP is 3.15%. There is, unless cost of borrowing for the government itself comes down, there is absolutely no fiscal space. So, so what so is your advice cost? to the governor is to reduce interest rates further? That sounds uh, like Ajay Shah. The, 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 the governor um, and the MPC have a mandate, and they are, they are fit to meet that. I, if you're asking for policy prescriptions, I think the necessary condition yeah. is to have effective interest rates down. For that, we need to... Uh, so, so given that the repo rate... So the, the spread between the RBI set rate and the average cost at which banks lend is at a record high right now, right? It has two so parts. how do you get it down? Yes, it has two parts. First is what you would call duration risk. So uh, the, the RBI set rate is for a two-week period. Uh, the average loan could be for five to 10 years. Uh, and so there is a duration risk. It is established by the fact that the government bond yield. So you know, so we are in a strange situation where the banks whose average cost of funding is 5% are very happy to park the funds at 4.65, 4.6% 4 in the overnight market but are unwilling to buy safe government bonds even at 7% yield, right? And uh, I think that's a dysfunction because a lot of the loans are benchmarked to the government bond yields and so, we need to get them down. Uh, the second, are you saying that risk. most of the mystery is going to be solved around interest rates? I mean, once you get that right, the economy will be okay. okay. So there is no, is much ki ek dawa nahi Right? So you need to attack the problem on multiple fronts. It is, it is impossible to get someone to invest. See, the revenue growth, look at the companies. When nominal GDP growth was 14%, companies were regularly growing revenues at 15%. And their debt used to be taken care of by inflation. Right. Five years after uh, you've taken the loan, when you go for refinancing, your revenue has grown so much, so your real cost of debt is down 
Banks are very happy uh, rolling it over. They're not used to this. So you go for a loan rollover and suddenly you find that uh, the bank is saying, oh, your revenue is not grown, your debt is so high, so you need to get the cost of debt. So that's a necessary condition. The second way of getting down interest rates is to reduce the uncertainty on the, in the financial system. So uh, for that, I, I also agree. I don't think TARP kind of solution is, is, is the most ideal, but... So you're saying most of the solutions lie in the financial sector. I mean, it looks like you're saying the financial sector is the reason it is, why... It has to be an integral part of any solution that is thought of. Okay. So uh, I'm going to get people... So Bunty, you need to tell me time. So we're going to get questions from the, you all. But before I do that, I need to have some rapid-fire questions, okay? Because uh, we need to put these people on the spot. Uh, number one, uh, you, so you, Dr. Kilkar, you said uh, the, the book begins with market failure and Sajid has talked a lot about it. That's, they said if the market is failing, that is if you have pollution, if a company is producing pollution, the, you know, the market will not take care of this problem. So we have externalities or you have Im asymmetric information. Somebody who's buying a medicine doesn't know if the medicine is good or not. So some government has to put the disclosure requirements, right? Then you have... Uh, public goods, like the criminal justice system. So you have three or four uh, market failures, and that's where the state needs to get in. Otherwise, the state should stay out. But you haven't mentioned the big market failure, which is poverty. I mean, India's biggest problem, I think, right now, one of the biggest problems is how to get some 200 or 250 million people out of poverty. Isn't poverty a failure of the market system? What do we do about that? We start with the proposition that in India, the only we have get to go is accelerating growth. And we identified what the constraints are uh, growth. Growth is the only lasting solution against poverty. Okay. Because that's going to create demand for labor. So high economic growth is an yeah. absolute essential precondition to reducing yeah. poverty. Inequality? You know, I, I may be making a very Politically incorrect statement. Because, you know, just But I give personally much greater preference to remove the poverty at this stage of development. I think. There is a feeling in India that the inequality, the gap between the haves and have nots, whether it is economic dimension, social dimension, regional dimension, geography, it's, it's widening. And, and it's just, it's, it's continues I, to I widen. I would still focus on growth. You agree, Ajay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is what the book is like. It is very crisp. <laughs> can I tell one more story? Uh, last week or two weeks ago, Lan Pritchett was in uh, Delhi doing a talk, and I was the designated discussant. Okay. okay. So there was somebody in the room with great emotional fervor said to Lant, you're talking all this stuff about state capacity and all that, and, but what do you think about inequality? And Lant said that uh, uh, he, that is Lant, takes the prize for the world's uh, number one economist who does not take interest in inequality and does not worry about inequality, okay, at all. So he says there are many other problems in the universe and inequality is not one of them. That gentleman who asked the question was really a very earnest, uh, you know, older person. And he turned to me and said, Ajay, what do you think? I said, I totally disagree with Lant. Uh, he gets number two, I get number one. <laughs> okay, one market failure, so inequality is not a problem anyway. So one market failure is, you said, monopolies. So uh, Dr. Mr. Ramadurai mentioned that India has achieved fantastic, it's 10% uh, of all uh, Uber rides are in India. The highest number of actually, uh, I think Facebook subscribers live in India and so on and so forth. Uh, is predatory pricing a market failure? Anybody want to take a question? Almost by definition, right? If there's market power, predatory pricing is, is is a derivative of market power, and that is so predatory pricing is market failure, which requires state intervention. Would you agree? Ajit, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going. I'm going to duck some of these bouncers. I'm going to, because I, I, <laughs> I'm not wearing a helmet tonight. Uh, um, no, let me just sidestep. And I, I think we're we're being a little bit glib. There's something different about this slowdown, which which we're, which we're not ignoring. Let, yes. Let, let me just uh, sorry, sorry provoke you. If you have uh, services at very, very cheap or almost zero prices, it's great for the consumer. So how can it be a problem? It's good for consumer welfare. Sorry? Because if you take a more intertemporal view of things, yeah. right? 
Okay. And the point is that's being done by definition predatory pricing so that over time there is market power and then oh, and intertemporally uh, prices are pushed up far beyond marginal costs. Uh, and so a lot of consumer surplus is extracted in the future. That's what I would, I would, so I would not, this comes back to general equilibrium thinking, right? So you don't look at today and here and now, you look at the, uh, the interplay of this over time. Yeah, so nobody uh, does zero pricing out of charity. There is the intent of consolidating the market, of gaining market power, and then charging supernormal prices okay. exactly. and uh, recouping those investments. Yeah. For example, in telecom, for example, in taxis, so, uh, in many fields. Now, okay. the question is, is it a problem big enough to merit state intervention? And if so, would you rather intervene early or would you rather intervene late? Sequencing. Yeah. And over the decades, there have been different views on the subject. In the early 20th century United States uh, thinking, it was it made sense to intervene early. And then in the 70s and 80s, the view in the United States shifted that let the consumers get a free lunch now, and when the recoupment starts, I'll intervene in the market at that time. And I think today's view would be that by the time a dominant position is established in one of these electronic platforms, it will be it's too late to and it's too difficult. And even, yeah, I would argue in India, even there's political economy constraints, right? That once you get used to a certain way of life, it's hard for a government down the road, for example, to reverse even tax cuts. So political economy, it's actually the bigger meta thing there is above economics and public policies, political economy. Right, Dr. Kelka? No, but before that, I want to mention that uh, in our next edition, we will do it. Oh, OK. <laughs> because this is one uh, uh, area in which a game theory has enormous insights. And we propose to, uh, because they're all strategic games, interdependent players, and a lot of interesting insights coming on theory from what we call science. So you are just anticipating our next uh, edition. No, great. We look forward to that. In fact, uh, there's a famous uh, incident where the Queen of England, she came to London School of Economics in 2008, uh, no, 2000, early 2009, and she asked a simple question. London School of Economics, by the way, LSE, like all star cast economists. She asked, how did this so great crash happen? <laughs> 11 years later, still people can't, go, there's no good answer. <laughs> So this is an economy which is supposedly functions, the market functions well, but everybody was supposed to do their jobs. The auditors, the regulators, the rating agencies, the central bank, this, everybody was, you know, not, not just sleeping on their jobs. Some people were are downright, you know, committing fraud. That's the political economy book that's coming out next, so we won't talk about it today. I want to uh, ask, uh, would you support UBI, Nilkant? U UBI is universal basic income. It was mentioned in the economic survey three, four years ago, I think, and it's gaining traction. Um, like 1,000 rupees to every man, woman, child in India. I think the, if it is accompanied by, I mean, so if it is like true UBI, I mean, you're just accompanied by the withdrawal of many of the directed subsidies, and that the fiscal space is, is, is suitable. Uh, see, for example, if you are, if you are replacing all of food subsidy. I mean, so there are there are strange problems that are emerging. You know, there so, is this, so you won't support UBI without first withdrawing subsidies. Which it has to be accompanied by that, and that I think will be. Uh, but isn't PM Kisan kind of a UBI for Kisan for farmers? It is a starting point to, uh, uh, and I think what PM Kisan is starting to solve. See, the, the, I think the if you look at the budgetary allocation, there was as an assumption that there are 14 crore farmers who will benefit from this. Uh, it kind of kind of tapering off at seven crore. So where are the other seven crore farmers? Uh, there are all kinds of hypotheses on where they are. I mean, some of them may not have the land records in their name. Some of them may not have computerized. Some of the other are linked. It will lead to a cleanup of land records. It will lead to a cleanup of you know the bank record and and other linked. That will take a long time. I mean, and even then yeah. you won't be sure. No, but see, UBI is, is, is see by itself. Uh, if you are see, there are many distortionary subsidy. Food subsidy is very distortionary. You know, there are nutritional problems that are seen in areas where PDS is working very efficiently. Because, uh, I mean, there was this study where uh, tribals near outside of Ranchi in Jharkhand and tribals in, in, in uh, Andhra Pradesh. So Andhra Pradesh, the PDS works very well. The, the males, see, the, the kids get midday meals. The women, because of uh, uh, other you know, maternal health, etc., there is intervention. But for the males, they found that the micronutrient health was much worse in Andhra Pradesh than in Jharkhand because Jharkhand, they don't get the PDS. So if you're getting 30 kilos, 35 kilos of rice, 
you you fill your stomach with that but in india's hunger index despite the large food subsidies we, india's we'll hunger come to index that, actually got in the worse yeah so so the 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 distortionary elements like say fertilizer we all know it's well discussed what fertilizer subsidy does what what food subsidy does and i think uh, if you remove that and you make it one transfer i it, it, it's all good but tack, tacking it on to i mean i i don't think it is something what i think actually the answer is clear right i think we should all admit there's absolutely no fiscal space for anything universal in india it's 10% of gdp is the deficit what all of us can i think unambiguously agree is if you replace all product based subsidies instead of that you give an electronic cash transfer there are multiple benefits a you get greater consumer choice which is what economic theory says b you take away multiple prices from the market so there's less distortion and three you can target it better the discussion should be how do you transition from product based to cash based and how do you give the cash base to get mac- maximum efficacy brazil has done this bolsa familia tells you that if you give the cash to the oldest woman in the household you actually get very good outcomes in terms of what that money is spent for okay, i good, think that's what the debate needs to be fair enough so we're going to quickly go to the audience now but i just want to uh, at least this part i want to end with two other things one is i want to read a paragraph uh, from the book it says politicians and officials are not benevolent they are self interested actors what appears to be an entrenched mindset or an entrenched organizational culture is always endogenous to incentives too many big words but basically the next sentence is more interesting a government organization that is riven with corruption is not one where which was unlucky to get a lot of corrupt people it is one where the rules of the game facilitate corruption so basically uh, the the rules of the game and then finally it uh, this is where i want to uh, ask you question dr kilkar that this is about the voter rationality so the policy makers uh, the the book makes a diff- distinction between policy making and law making so our law makers are in parliament or in legis- state legislatures and policy making is different but that distinction uh, is we can sort of ignore it for the time being so the voter so the voters uh, don't have incentives so basically the the it says democracy is a system where wicked people lie to stupid people and <laughs> why do things go wrong because the people lack incentives to know about public policy so you guys are fantastic you showed up here to to listen to public policy but basically most people just don't don't want to know about public policy the romantic notion of democracy involves listening to the people but the people generally do not know much about policy they're not interested uh and then it says uh that this is not a new idea it has been known since the republic of plato 380 bc it says direct democracy does not work well even if you have technology taking policy questions to individuals through referendums does not work well brexit july uh, june 2016 not only the pundits got it wrong pundits you know scholars but even the punters who put their money ladbrokes where they bet money 5 is to 1 the money was against brexit but brexit won so there's a lot, so it says there's a quote and this is a quote the fact of having the majority on one side does not in any way prove that one must be right indeed humanity has always advanced through the initiative and efforts of individuals and minorities whereas the majority by its very nature is slow conservative submissive to superior force and to established privileges so this is the last part before we go to god's question you 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 actually dwell some you dwell a little bit on the book on on voter representation and the fact that there's a there's a relationship between the citizens or voters and lawmakers is like a principal agent relationship so how do you get policy right when people just don't care to invest time in understanding complicated public policy ajay well first what people we just saying is that let's not have a romantic idea that the people will think about policy okay so right. let's not think of referendums uh, we suffer from many friends who are engineers who say we will run a voting app on the mobile phone and then should you have a gst single rate or multiple rate we will put it to the people and then the people will choose what is the right gst structure it's a very nice idea but the problem is not technology the problem is incentives it's that, not market failure um, it's not efficient it's a free rider problem it's not efficient for an individual so i always say that an individual takes more effort choosing a toothpaste than deciding how to vote so there is a basic problem there and uh, so the best that we know is our construct construct of a republic of a representative democracy where the people elect a representative based on shared values and not 
tangible policy platforms. And then the representative is supposed to work 24 by 7 in thinking about the policy questions and figuring it out. So this is just to give a sense of that landscape that let's not go down this unrealistic path of uh, trying to deepen democracy by doing the referendums and yeah. by using electronics to take these decisions down to the people. Okay. Let us work with the very old idea of building a republic through a representative democracy. It's hard, it's messy, but that's all we got. Okay, so we remember the goal is to have a do boring, dull government and parliament. And when I said Belgium, I didn't, I, I meant it I meant it uh, purposefully because Belgium is only the only other country apart from Afghanistan which is under war, which actually ran for two years without a government. And GDP growth was higher, exports flourished. Anyway, <laughs> so now we got to, please, it's your, please be brief, specific, ask, answer, ask your questions. I get to be the moderator so I can ruthlessly direct the traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Prakash. Hi, um, I'm Prakash Abalkar. My question is for Sajid. In the current discussion about the slowdown, very often GST is mentioned as uh, contributing. And I'm puzzled because GST was designed to be revenue neutral. That means whatever earlier taxes we are collecting in 16 different forms, we are collecting in a single tax. So if it is revenue neutral, there's been no increase in taxation. So why is that causing a slowdown? It's a great question. In fact, I would go further and say GST has not been revenue neutral. Collections from GST have been lower than the old system, and that's the problem. In fact, I won't say the weighted average rate today is 11.5%, not the 15, 15 .5 that we thought was a static revenue neutral rate, uh, uh, and therefore states are pushing for higher rates. Uh, one could argue if it's a very complex system, and the book talks about this in another context, if there are you know, huge compliance costs and deadweight losses, that can hurt production decisions, efficiency. I think that's a second order effect. 30 seconds, for me, uh, this slowdown has you know, um, uh, uh, many reasons, but let's not forget the balance sheet issue. Below all of this is a balance sheet issue which I would say is a quadruple balance sheet issue, right? We began with the well-known Arvind Subramaniam twin balance sheet issue, corporates and banks. Uh, I would add to that household balance sheets because you had a period in time where if you indulge me for 30 seconds, that as corporates were getting deleveraging and getting healthier, and banks were taking care of their NPAs, you had this less regulated system in the NBFC start lending, and they were literally thrusting money into the hands of consumers. Uh, and what you then found is even household balance sheets are a little more impaired now. Household debt has gone up from 18% of GDP to 30% in a matter of four years. 30% is not alarming, but the rate of accretion is alarming. So you now have a household balance sheet that's not in the best of shape. You have a financial sector which you've got Bank NPAs have come down, contingent NPAs coming out of NBFCs and other sectors of the economy, and corporates that had begun to deleverage but not finished. And on the back of all this is a public sector balance sheet where debt to GDP was coming down, as Neelkan said, because inflation was high. Now with inflation falling and normal interest rates not falling as much, the R minus G pincer is working against borrowers. So debt to GDP has flattened and is actually threatening to rise. So, so I think so underpinning you, all of the cyclical stuff, you've got is it, going, is it getting better? Sorry? In the next three months, six months? I is think it so. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm going to... Thank you. Know, you. Read, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So your question. Can we get a mic here? You can just shout. Yeah. Uh, this for Dr. So, Anade. Yeah. Which is more greater in India? Uh, market failure or government failure? Market failure is easily quantifiable. Whereas government failure, we are afraid to talk about. I am the moderator. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, we came here for in service of the Republic by Dr. Kirkar and Dr. Shah. We got a lot of service of the Republic by Dr. Ajit Ranade. <laughs> so can I now ask the authors, we are in a country which is going through a crisis with there's a continuous sinking feeling in the business and a lot of people as to our economy is creating a big crisis for us. If the Prime Minister were to ask, seek your advice, what are the important two things or three things you would tell? I know there are advisors to the Prime, Prime Minister here, to those we've forgotten for a moment. From you two, what would you suggest in the service of the Republic? I did, this is too serious a question, which you can't be answered like uh, one minute. There's no quick fix. 
There is no magic bullet. There's one line I'll give to anybody who asks me the question, and then one has to work out. There are a lot of majors and a number of fronts. There is no magic bullet. I don't say personally, no magic bullet. Sure, there's no yeah. Hi. Just slightly different from him that Mark II has run its course and we need to look deep into our hearts and think about foundational questions. And all of us, this room, this community, we need to think about what is a Mark III going to be. And our submission in this would be focus, do fewer things, create conditions for the private sector to feel safe, create conditions for the private sector to be optimistic and invest. In fact, yeah, this is that's what the book is all about. This individual enterprise. Leave it to the, get the state out. I, let me take a minute to sort of one anecdote, apocryphal. I don't think it's true. I don't know. It sounds true. So when we got independence, uh, so we had a prime minister Nehru, and he told his party men, Congress people, to go to the length and breadth of the country to remote corners to tell the people of India, the Britishers have left. You have, we are free now. We are Swaraj. So apparently these people went to the remote corners and said, British chale guy, they have gone, you're free now. So the common refrain was, oh, then who's going to rule us now? So anyway, so basically, yes, please. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one question I have, maybe it's already addressed in the book and I haven't read it, uh, but we've seen privatization by stealth in a lot of sectors, like say, for example, telecom yeah. in power generation. Uh, one of the key sources like, of, of this current crisis is banking. And uh, we see PSU banks have a very large share because of their liability, because I'm very comfortable placing my deposits in a PSU bank. That's why they have a large market share. Yeah. And these banks have not done the best job of uh, uh, What's doing your credit analysis. So, question. So, no, so my question is, what can be done? Because if that is one of the key sources where credit risk is not being priced lower because they have a big uh, the question problem. question is to anybody, any specific So person? I think Neelkant mentioned it first and as well as uh, Neelkant, Mr. Dr. You, Kilkar or Dr. Shah. Neelkant, but let me also remind you, during the height of the 2008 crisis, a company like Infosys put out advertisements saying that we are moving 1,000 crores from a private bank to State Bank of India. They had to tell their investors and, and the public at large. So. No, I think uh, there needs to be better education. I think the fact that uh, the government puts six, seven thousand crores every year in Air India, and there is a public acceptance that uh, Air India. I mean, so there is no sympathy for uh, Air India anymore. The fact that three lakh crores of taxpayer money has been put into PSU banks, and that uh, even at the best of times there was fifteen, twenty thousand crores a year being invested as equity, and these are all these are all losses that are being filled up by the taxpayers' money. I think better education. Uh, is is very important, uh, and and without that, um, you know, I think the political change of so so the the privatization by stealth, which was I think uh, perhaps what was intended for banks as well, like what happened in airlines and telecom, uh, is clearly going to take too long because in 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 the in telecom and in airlines, the private sector was willing to grow at hundred percent or fifty percent none of the banks should be growing at 50%, right? And therefore, the loss of market share will take 20 years for the private sector, the public sector to become the size that we want it to be. And therefore, it needs to be urgent action, but before that, we need to build the political setup so that that process can start. Dr. Gregor, on banking. No, I just want to read the title of the chapter is will be my response. Cross the river by feeling the stones. Cross the river by feeling the stones. Then shopping. Then shopping. It's too. Rajiv Lal. Yeah. to do it in a very way. I, anyway. I have a question. Can I? So wait. Sorry. Let's oh, get this sort one first. Sure. Yeah. Way in which we do a lot of learning is required. It's not a. It's not a, such a sort of a simple approach. Let's do it for every bank. We don't know enough, frankly. Then Xiaoping had great, you know, uh, the, this one was, let's cross the river by one stone, by feeling the stones. Second was, it doesn't matter what is the color of the cat, so long as it catches the mice. Yeah. Right. So uh, on that note, I, I wanted to press uh, Dr. Kelkar and Ajay on uh, uh, one of their conclusions. Uh, you know, you keep saying that growth is more important than inequality. And in an analytical sense, yes, there can be no disagreement. At least, certainly, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, 
you have to have growth before you can deal with inequality because you otherwise don't have the resources to redistribute. But as a matter of political economy, and this is where I think uh, uh, a modification to your message could actually be much more powerful, which is to say that in order in our country to buy legitimacy for creating space for markets, it is politically imperative to demonstrate to the general voting public that the market is also working for them. In order to do that, we must simultaneously fix state capacity to at least improve the perception of fairness of our welfare system. So to that extent, inequality matters. That's why this, you know, the debate on cash transfers, how to use technology, how to use the efficiency of the state and capacity of the state to improve redistribution by even using fewer resources is vitally important. That's why routinely we have political rhetoric on rich versus poor. Even though inequality, you say, doesn't matter at, at this stage. Right. All the time, the political economy is, is influenced by it. So, so that's my, I don't know if you want to react to that, because I think this is important. Otherwise, you will create an unnecessary debate on growth versus inequality. And that is not your intent. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Dharmendra Rai. Uh, my question is for everybody, but especially for Ajay and Ajit. Behavioral economics is very powerful. It's tried and tested now. Two economists have won, behavioral economists have won a Nobel Prize. The UK government has started a nudge unit which has got spectacular results. They just changed a few words in a letter and they managed to enhance tax compliance by billions of dollars. So why has behavioral economics not got the attention it deserves both from the government as well as the private sector in India? Well, actually, the Niti Aayog, I know, has a very large nudge unit, but that's not the answer to your question. So, um, we love the work of Kahneman and Tversky. Thinking Fast and Slow is one of the greatest books ever. So, we share your concepts. However, uh, there is a sequencing in this. Uh, we're a country which does not do basics. We don't know how to run courts. Okay, We don't know how to run a tax administration. We don't know how to do tax policy. So... Around the concept of market failure and implementation failure, there is a greater ability to build something more objective, more unambiguous, where we can debate around it, we can achieve consensus, and we can learn that capability. Because you will agree that once you start thinking that I will use some of these behavioral concepts and I will have a nudge unit and I will indulge in these interventions, there's actually a lot of complex fudge factors which will easily turn into arbitrary power in the hands of decision makers. And we know how that story turns out. So think about it as the future evolution of the republic. We are at the stage of developing the mid 19th century capabilities of the UK on the basics of a criminal justice system, of a tax system. So let's focus on those foundations. Since you asked, answer, I'll take a minute. So nudge. You know, this is, of course, behavioral economics is a, is a very big field and nudge does work. But I'll just give an example. You know, there was a time in our country when you didn't have to write, Yaha peshab mat kijiye. You know, don't, don't urinate here, don't, don't piss here. Or don't play your transistor radio loudly in buses. So that, that era is over. Now you actually have these things. So some people in private societies and all, they say they're outside walls. They wanted to prevent urination. So they started putting, painting pictures of gods and, uh, you know, Ganesha, Hanuman. It worked for some time. It worked for some time. That era is also over. So the gods are also pissed upon. So what is this, you know, so the nudge, you know, how much will you nudge? So I think, you know, the reason is because we don't have efficient enforcement of the law that you don't get punished if you, if you, you know what happens in Singapore, right? So as, as, as Ajay said, you know, it's basics. Yeah. There's a question at the yeah. back. Yeah, that lady at the back. Hello. Can you give the mic to that lady there? Hi. Uh, this is Arvind Chari from Quantum Advisors. Sorry, can you just give the mic to the lady, then you go ne after her. You're next after her, yeah. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, good evening, my name is Jeanette. My question is mostly about, uh, for ease of communication, between the 13th Finance Commission and the 15th, I think we'll all agree that there's, uh, uh, India has changed in one fundamental way, that inflation has come down structurally. But 
the broader voting public, as you would call it, uh, who doesn't really think about public policy, still wants an 8% return on their fixed deposit. They still want an 8% return on every bit of savings that they do. Where is the failure there, and how do you correct it? You say, what is the failure in people still expecting 8%? That's a failure. OK, the, well, OK. Sajid. So we wrote a piece on this to say, you know, why, if you just look at, uh, as you give me 30 seconds, why, you know, Neelkan said why interest rates haven't come down. Uh, 2019 and 2015, great parallels. Policy rates came down 125 basis points then, it's 135 basis points now. By this time in the cycle, 90% of policy rate cuts had transmitted to lending rates. In 2019, only 33%. So you ask why? Are banks very risk averse? Why aren't they cutting rates more? Then you look on the deposit side, and you find that in 2015, 80% uh, of policy rate cuts had transitioned to deposit rates by this time of the cycle. This time, it's a grand total of 12%. You have to ask yourself, why have banks not cut deposit rates more? There are two hypotheses, one of which you pointed to. One is, well, I'll avoid gibbly gobbly, but small savings rates are compete with bank deposits. In 2015, the wedge was nothing. Now the wedge is 150 basis points, so banks are worried perhaps if you cut deposit rates now, it'll go to small savings because that wedge is very high, which the, the policy implication is small savings should move with market rates. But the second one hypothesis is normal illusion. That real deposit rates today are still very high. Nilkan said the last two years, inflation has averaged 3%. Deposit rates are 6%. Three percentage points in real terms. More than they were in 2015. But in normal terms, 6% just doesn't sound good enough for me. And perhaps that's why banks shy away from cutting rates more for fear of losing these deposits to asset classes. So again, I think it comes down to a little bit of behavioral economics, a little bit of market failure. You, know, you can use these terms loosely. It's a nominal illusion. The if Jay, you focus yeah. on nominal more than real variables. It's a yeah, very good I, question. Last question, right? Yeah, last Hi. question. Ajay, uh, you don't criticize the RBI as much as you used to before. What has changed? <laughs> Ajay will answer the question. See, he's got more white hair now. He's wiser. He's cooler. <laughs> Inflation targeting. You know, the, 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 the sort of monetary policy committee, the whole thing that has been campaigning for it. In fact, there's a lot of it on, in the book. So we are going to now uh, sort of wrap up. Uh, but I want to just read this part before. It will take me half a minute to read. This is page 122. This is about, you know, uh, I, the book has many, many, many concepts. It's not just about market failure and how to read in them. It's not only about the importance of incentives. But this part, I want to read about tools and objectives. You know, when government has programs, objectives, and instruments. So uh, it's about uh, NREG as the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. It says it has actually been very successful. See, policy thinkers were attracted by three key features of, the, of NREGs. They are self-targeting. Only the poorest come on the projects. Then they are self-adjusting, meaning if you, you know, you go only when there's a lean cycle, and they're self-liquidating. So when you become, when you're not poor anymore, you don't go to the work sites. So this is an example where the policy design was right. And yet there is a concept of what is called mission creep or policy creep. It's actually, I mean, it's not a total failure, but there's a lot of problems with NRGS. So there, this is used in the book to illustrate how these, uh, this, even such schemes which was well designed and had all these good, great features, many of the beneficial features of the NREGA originally envisaged were not obtained. So even the best policy makers and best policy design can fail because in practice, uh, it's, it's the, the, the reality is very messy. You know, they say that, uh, however, this is a country, you know, with great potential and, you know, 8% and 10% growth. So as they say, India is, India or the economy or the country, is a country of great potential, and sh and it shall remain so. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so on that note, uh, I thank the panelists for being a wonderful discussion. And thank you all of you for being. Thank you. Thank you.